All right. Well, welcome to Brain Health Office Hours. We have uh, a wonderful guest to chat with today. Um, we have a little different format than usual because we don't have a live audience, but I think that you're still going to really enjoy this conversation. Um, I'm Dr. Julie Frattantoni. I am a scientist here at the Center for Brain Health, and um, we'll just do real quick introductions, and then we'll get right to it. Yep, Dan Krawczyk, I study reasoning and decision making in the brain and in society. And I'm Dr. Michael James Lundy, and I'm a staff cognitive scientist at Applied Research Associates and uh, formerly a uh, PhD student in uh, Dan's lab. Awesome. Well, um, to kick it off, I mean, we have a lot of different things that we could cover. Um, I love this idea of, you know, understanding better how tribalism really affects us and so I'm just gonna kick it off with that this idea of toxic tribalism what is that what does it mean how does it affect us yeah yeah I'm happy to kind of go into the origin stories of how I develop an interest in this topic and also the way I, I've come to understand this this term of, of tribalism which I think like many other terms that we use as scientists, like bias, right? Uh, I think it's something that's recognizable to mostly people what we're referring to, uh, especially when it comes to our political lives. What it means to have allegiances to one's belief system that can make it difficult for us to be open-minded towards others and to be curious and exploratory about what other people might think uh, as far as uh, po policies are concerned, political candidates, uh, as far as what um, America represents, uh, a vision for the future. Um, I started to develop an interest in this topic actually uh, just around the time of, of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, I was working uh, on the neural correlates, uh, the brain based, uh, the brain basis for our ability to pay attention, problem solve. So I was working in a very different area. And then um, let's just say that the in-person research was not uh, all that possible to conduct. <laughs> in the conditions of COVID. And so I was searching for a new topic and Dan and I were, were saying, okay, well, we can either just sit around twiddling our thumbs, waiting for better conditions to do in-person research, or we can set sail in a brand new Vista. And it was around this time, I was spending some time online and I noticed just how rapidly, within months, there were already uh, political tribes starting to form around COVID measures when it comes to masking and then later with vaccines. And I was fascinated by this phenomenon, uh, this inability to try to engage in dialogue with someone who holds a different uh, a belief system. And uh, so that's how I found myself uh, uh, specializing in that area for my dissertation work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. That's right. And uh, for tribes, I, I think when we consider the brain as a sort of a tribal engine, you know, we, we are social and we need to be social with close others and we need to be social with somewhat distant others and in society now we have the ability to create tribes almost within our own minds based on the information landscape being so impersonal and I think that that gets into a lot of what you had said about uh, politicizing COVID right away. It's often the information landscape, not so much the people and so dialogue is an answer because it's up close and personal and we have the facial expressions, we have the emotional connection that you don't get from um, other uh, media sources or information sources. So maybe we should talk a little about that, how close dialogue with another person or, or a few other people like we're doing right now has some strong advantages that we can leverage toward that, that polarization problem that we're all facing regularly. Right. When I started my uh, research in this topic, it was always with an eye towards what the solutions might be. Uh, if you spend time in your local bookstore, you're not going to find any shortage of writings on this topic uh, about tribalism, what to do about it. But when it comes to solutions, uh, that's when you find that maybe it gets buried somewhere in the epilogue. It's like, well, it's some kind of hand wavy solutions about, well, we need to figure out how to just get along, right? But I think where a lot of my um, thinking on this topic has brought me to is the realization that what we're built for is in-person dialogue. We're built for it. And you, you can see how important that is to have that ability to connect with somebody, to be in their presence. Um, when you see what dialogue, if you want to call it that, <laughs> very loose of the term, online. If you look at social media, um, what 
uh, conversations about politics tend to look like, where mostly it's about expressing one's point of view as opposed to trying to understand what somebody else's perspective on, on a top topic might be. And one of the issues is how uh, because of the way social media algorithms work, if you have spent time looking at a certain type of content and it reinforces your point of view, you're more likely to see more of the same uh, in your feed day after day after day. And our brains, um, we're pattern-seeking creatures. And so we start to have this um, exaggerated sense of the certainty mm. uh, of, of our belief system it becomes almost impossible for us to even imagine an alternative way of seeing the world. And so when we do find ourselves in these face-to-face -face encounters, it, it, it seems almost, um, it's astonishing. In fact, you think, really? You see it that way? How can that, possi how can that possibly be the case? Uh, and, and I think that this is a feature of the present world and the way in which information is consumed. It's not like in generations past where there was something ritualistic about being consumers of news and information. There was this idea that it's the six o'clock news. There was just a few channels that you listened to in the in the in the sixties and seventies, and there was that epistemic bedrock, that same knowledge base that we could all draw from to have a common understanding, uh, um, a common vocabulary for describing events around us. And we don't really live in those conditions anymore, which makes it more difficult to in engage in dialogue. Yeah, it's fascinating to think how. AI and these algorithms are changing just the, our perception of the world and that our information channels are not just, um, I mean, it's hard to have kind of an unbiased channel to begin with, but um, even more so now because it's catering exactly to the things that we are engaging with. And so, um, Dan, will you talk a little bit about maybe confirmation bias and um, just how that works? And Right, we're sense makers. You know, we're, we seek to construct some sort of sensible reality on a day-to-day -day basis. And in a nation as large as we have with uh, as complex and diverse a population we, we have and so much terrain to cover, we are, you know, sort of thirsting for this uh, ability to form a coherent picture. And our media landscape is very diverse as well. So you can find everything from outright propaganda channels that will tell you exactly things that align with a very coherent worldview, which is not realistic. And you can also find very rigorous journalism, which presents the world as a complex picture that's hard to make sense of. And I, I think it's difficult for us to embrace the discomfort of experiencing uncertainty and, and having to wait for answers mm -hmm. and wait for information to unfold. And uh, you know, around COVID, for example, it's a novel virus that we should not be very confident in as to what the solutions are, nor should we expect our public officials to be confident with ready answers. We should be suspicious if they're presenting certainty too quickly. The difficulty is certainty is so, um, alluring, I suppose, mm -hmm. it, it just to, to sort of fit it into our, our sort of generalized worldview feels good and it feels good to make sense of things. So once we begin, once our minds kind of gravitate toward a certain perspective, confirmation bias is where we begin to selectively cherry pick those supportive facts or quote unquote facts that um, align and then we discount all of these sort of pesky alternative viewpoints which probably we should pay attention to. So I, I think a lot of what fighting confirmation bias is about is remaining a rigorous thinker and you have to actively try to stay open-minded mm -hmm. because it's not our natural state, right? We, we want the easy answer and once it's presented we, f we fall into this, it's almost like a snowball effect where we now begin to believe that with great confidence and we become overconfident very quickly. Yeah, so what are just practical tips? You know, I know it's like, okay, everyone, most people would consider themselves open-minded. Mm. However, <laughs> when we're interacting with information that is conflicting to what we believe is true, you know, the brain actually perceives that as threatening, right? And, and it actually can't then make sense or kind of reason through that with, you know, those different systems at play. And so what are some ways that people can you know, practically as you're engaging with, whether it's articles or social media, how can we kind of set ourselves up 
to have a better, whether it's filter or just, you know, be able to take that information in? I think one of the most important features of the brain that needs to be taken into consideration in trying to describe how to engage in dialogue successfully is to realize we need to have a target. We always need to have a, a goal-orienting system. There's a sense of progress and victory whenever you're engaging in something that has a rewarding um, feeling about it, right? Uh, because the way in which uh, information is delivered to us. Um, most of the time it's in a very combative sense, right? It's about one side defeating another side. And so our, our brains attuned to that sense of being successful insofar as we're being a good representative of our point of view and dismantling another point of view. In order to change that habit, you need to have a different goal-oriented system. And in my, in my opinion, it's about growing oneself. It's, about, it's, a, it's a journey in self-discovery and helping somebody else to engage in their own journey of self-discovery. A very punishing stimulus can be rewarding when it's nested in the proper goal-orienting system. A good example, if I just pick up this table right now, I'm going to feel the strain of bearing a heavy weight. I'm going to feel the strain of my muscles, right? If I'm in a gym and I'm doing the exact same thing, that painful stimulus now is rewarding to me because I know it's in the pursuit of progress. I'm trying to build my body up be more athletic. Mm -hmm. Similarly, it could be a painful experience if I hear somebody sharing a point of view that is at odds with my own. Mm -hmm. But I recognize that this is to be expected. It, it's really a, uh, obvious that we're all going to have different perspectives on the world. And insofar as I can open my mind to understand that perspective, I have a diversity of ways of interpreting the world around me. I'm able to build more bridges mm -hmm. as, a, as a consequence of learning from somebody who sees the world differently. From now it's actually more rewarding. The more, the more diametrically opposed somebody's opinion might be from my own, mm -hmm. the more potential for growth. Mm -hmm. That's one way I, I like to think about um, making our minds a little more flexible as far as adopting a, a new approach to engaging in political dialogue. I really like that of idea of having a goal before you engage with some information because I think especially with a lot of our media today or s particularly social media, it's passive engagement. People kind of just go on and just sort of scroll and kind of the information just kind of comes at you and you're not really there with a goal in mind other than t whether it's to be entertained or to you know just kind of see what's going on mm -hmm. in the world, what people are up to. So I like this idea of like I'm going to you know, engage with this for the reason of either connecting with others, understanding, you know, kind of having a, a setting kind of your mindset um, in terms of what that, in, what that time spent looks like. Because I think too often it just, and then we're, we're triggered and then we just respond and it's kind of just very reactive. Um, and we're not using our frontal lobe to really reason through and kind of think about how that information fits into a bigger picture. Um, so I love that idea of being really just proactive with the information that you are engaging with. Um, I'm curious, so what are things, so the, that's something that can, those are you know a couple solutions in terms of improving dialogue. We, we touched on earlier the difference between an in-person conversation and kind of an online one. Dan, I don't know if you have thoughts or want to touch on just from a brain perspective, what are what are we missing when we're online? What are we getting more of when we're in person? And how can we, you know, seek to have better interactions online? Because the, most of the world is virtual now. We're in a hybrid world. So it's not something that's going away. That's right. So I, I think what's stripped away from the type of conversation that we're having now in person are, are the nonverbal cues, the turn taking, and the sort of personalization, right? So we all are experiencing some level of immersion here, right? We can we can kind of read the room. Mm -hmm. We can sense the tone of things. We, you know, we, if one of us makes a joke, we'll all get it because we're seeing the way right. someone carries themselves and those those micro changes. And we we tend not to. Um, think, just realize the importance of those, and it, like in the on the political stage, for example, debates have become the showpiece, you know, they, and it's because you're looking at the person speaking in an animated way and uh, getting behind that person. And with online communication of any sort, it tends to be short, right? We've sort of t gone from phone calls, which took away a lot of the nonverbals, but you could still get from voice. Mm -hmm things like humor or sarcasm 
Now you take that down to sort of email level, you know, impersonal paragraphs. Now we're down to text level where it's usually, you know, two, three lines. Three lines is like you're really out on a ledge with too long of a communication. So these short bursts that don't ha I mean, it's why we have emojis, mm -hmm. right? It's because it's so easy for the other party to misinterpret what you're saying simply because they don't have the context. So I, I think from a brain perspective, we're constantly taking in the context. And when we lack intonation, facial expressions, sort of the, the banter, um, a lot can become offensive or difficult. You know, it's kind of you, it's like your brain with itself just getting text, f heavily filtered text in the case of reading through um, you know, questionable news sources. I mean, news sources vary tre tremendously in rigor, and we're moving away from s serious journalism toward outright propaganda that feeds you a filtered, easy to read worldview that you're not going to question. And so you really start to get into trouble with your own sense of value on the material if it's coming at you very easily you don't have any context and it becomes impossible to understand how someone else would have a different viewpoint. Mm -hmm. It's really the answer I think is just in online communication or any sort of um, non-in-person media, you, you just lack that context and then you can become very carried away to where you're convinced of something that you've never really had a conversation with another person about. Mm -hmm. Of course, what we would say is maybe the remedy is to have the conversation. And I'll bring up a question, how do you do that with a very polarized, sort of um, difficult, the proverbial uncle at the, at the family dinner table who wants to rail about his politics? What, how do you address such a person? Is it worth addressing such a person? I think it always comes down to what you think you can accomplish. and. Uh, having a keen sense of what puts us into a more exploratory uh, mode of curiosity. Um, one uh, name I, I will drop here <laughs> really inspired my, my work in the series is Gordon Penny Cook. Um, he's a uh, very prominent researcher of uh, fake news, misinformation, how our brains uh, navigate just the morass of, of, of as you said, uh, a media landscape of very varying la levels of rigor and making it very difficult to discern what information to trust. Uh, I ran into him at a, at a conference and he said something that really stuck out because he, he was saying to me that his, th his um, impression is that when we're talking to somebody who's polarized or when somebody is in a polarized stance it's not that they're motivated th it, it's not like they're engaged in like a rigorous um, didactic reasoning process right uh, it's really the absence of thinking is what you're seeing Right? And where he sees thinking occur, it's when you have a conflict of intuitions. Right? It's surprise. It's when something breaks the pattern. I think what you can do with the proverbial uncle is you surprise them. They, they, that individual, that hypothetical individual, is not going to engage in dialogue because he thinks there's nothing to learn. He thinks he already understands who you are. There's nothing um, outside of his mind as far as what hat you're wearing, uh, who you're voting for. He thinks he has a full list of what needs to be known. But if you exhibit characteristics that are not supposed to belong to that category, it's a category error. It's not expected. If instead of ranting and raving at that individual for their views, instead you adopt a mode of curiosity. I mean, we're primates, right? We're social creatures. We're more likely to see recipro a reciprocal stance, mm -hmm. more likely to see intrigue, you know, a furrow about a brow of, hmm, that was not expected. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, the best play for those kinds of situations is you intrigue them as far as what they think you're supposed to say and you break script, yeah. right? Love that. Um, Switching gears a little bit, what is it about, you know, the, you see kind of just these really, like, the, the, it's almost like people enjoy the outrage. Mm. <laughs> they enjoy kind of the reaction and getting to have this, you know, whether mostly online because it is just sort of less civil and you're not having to say that to someone's face. What is it that is so kind of almost addicting mm. about that and those patterns? And what is it, yeah, what is it that's making people kind of continue in that? And it's for either of you. I, I like to bring up, I, I, I think, you know, 
one of the elements of the human mind that's interesting is we all have sort of a personal reality up in our head and then we have kind of engaging with the world you know you have the world which is reality reality and then you've got your own personal sort of reality that's infused with your emotions and your history and your values and then, and then there's this gap you know it's kind of navigating the gap between what what's out in the world and what's what's in your head and you're you're constantly having this interplay and um, I suppose one of the challenges we have is it, there's how, how to mind the gap in a constructive way so you don't begin to take on what kind of the world's telling you and just just adopt that as well mm -hmm. if the if my news sources tell me this or my close political friends tell me this that, that's reality you have to kind of hold that you know hold that off and in Japan they talk of the public face and the private face the public face being um, kind of the shared reality. You know, there's certain things that we use, we call it decorum, you know, where we don't, we're not provocative deliberately or offensive deliberately in person. And we rarely rise to that level. Whereas in the private face, you can feel like someone just stepping on your core beliefs. Mm -hmm. And so outrage and you know, sort of triggering is the mm -hmm. word we use now. Um, you're making a mistake there if you're answering with your private face, right? What you want to adopt is a public stance, um, the tatame, as it's called in Japan, <laughs> and the hone is your authentic sort of internal reality. So I think the internal reality and the external um, reality need to be kept in mind, and then it's, there's go there are going to be gaps. And you should encourage the, that, that feeling of tension that, that you alluded to, Michael, because you're noticing the gaps when you feel that tension. If everything is pre-baked and fits your um, current worldview, you're doing it wrong because mm -hmm. you're you're wearing your hone uh, you know on your sleeve, and it's going to the world is going to disappoint you and, and enrage you mm -hmm. because you're thinking you're taking it on as your personal values are being walked on. Mm -hmm. And I think, Michael, if you want to speak more about kind of just innate tribalism and why we even do that to begin with because that's getting into these you know more reptilian brain kind of just reactive survival mechanisms and so yeah why is that why are we wired that way what or not maybe not why we are wired that way but just speak more to how that kind of the origin of that and how that plays out here right in fact I know uh, when uh, Dan and I were exploring this topic together what we realized is if there was an approach to this that uh, would be distinctive to our uh, framework about toxic tribalism. It really intro it introduces um, this element of values as being so central here. Uh, that we're moralizing creatures. I, I think one of the more accessible um, uh, accessible uh, authors on this topic, and perhaps many audience members uh, might be familiar with his work, is Jonathan Haidt, uh, this moral foundations theory. This notion that when you're hearing somebody's point of view, uh, about politics on, on a candidate. Beneath that is this bedrock of moral principles that um, are, they transcend reason. It's not like you have a reason for thinking that respect is important or thinking that honor is important or uh, any other number of things that are sacred to us. It's bedrock. It, it's, it, it's what guides our reason. And when we feel that those values have been transgressed in some way, that's when we feel um, that there's a, a threat. That's where you see that the prefrontal cortex uh, shuts off and we feel like, okay, the tribe is under assault, right? What's most important to us is under threat. Um, and if we realize that that's the tripwire that's been hit in that situation, it's to uh, ensure that we recognize that the values that someone stands for are not what's at issue here because that's oftentimes what gets baked together it's what get, gets conflated in somebody's mind is that when you attack a certain candidate or a policy position they're an avatar that represents as a symbol of a value that's very important to them and i know dan you and i've had a lot of productive conversations on, on this topic that's right and values are at the core of everything to do with politics most successful campaigns are about we share values, right? I, I, I reflect the values of my voters if I'm a candidate. And it's, su it's suggestive that we have in a divided um, election, for example, that 
it's a battle of values that are incompatible, right? I think that's probably most people's perception. The science doesn't support that, actually, fortunately. <laughs> and it gives, the science gives us a little more insight here. So take um, environmental protection, right? That's a heavily politicized issue. It feels as if there's no common ground to be sought. Um, but if you look at the science of values, particularly Shalom Schwartz's work, who's an Israeli social psychologist who um, does a lot of survey research, and in over 90 cultures, he finds that there are 10 core values that pretty much every culture is going to express. Mm. And there are things like benevolence and universalism and power and achievement and security. Um, so some of the major drivers of our political intuitions and, and what we want to see from a government or a nation are things like security. But you, you got to balance that with self-direction. And we want to see universalism, which is a, a caring for the in environment, not just the natural environment, but the, in the business environment, our social environments, our media landscape even could fit into universalism. So we share, we share something in common with everyone and then we kind of bolt on these these political views on top of those values and so you can have someone expressing security in one way and another person wanting security as well but just expressing it in a completely different way gun control comes to mind for mm -hmm. some reason right <laughs> it's all about security mm -hmm. but then you mix in self-direction who has the firearm is it a authority figure or is it you and now there's something you can talk about, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about dialogue as, well, this other person shares the value of security. Mm -hmm. They may have a different idea about how to carry it out. That's something we can talk about. And we can bond, to Michael's mm -hmm. point, over you know, something shared. You can find, why do, how do we secure ourselves and our nation? That's a very easy question to lead in with in conversation. It doesn't bring all these polarized elements doesn't bring along that baggage and so that's one one other tip you can use is try to read how, what is someone actually valuing mm -hmm. it's it's not whatever the Republican or Democrats said they think it is mm -hmm. right but there's this other vocabulary that Schwartz offers us where you can say well that's security mixed with self-direction and it's in the service of helping others benevolence and if you, if you sort of think that way um, you have this superpower to to be able to you know, sort of find common ground in the mm -hmm. most unlikely places, so the tactics of how to how to how to use that are are, are critical. That's exactly right. It, this is a very powerful uh, tool. I think it, it's been demonstrated time and again. Um, you know, uh, I, I think one of my the most inspiring stories that I'm aware of uh, in this space, when you think about those we consider to be too far gone, right? Someone who, it, it goes beyond our idea that there could even be a conflict of values. We think of them as being like an odious figure in some, in some sense. Uh, I remember seeing a uh, um, uh, interview at the Majestic Theater in, in Dallas um, of a former uh, neo-Nazi named Christian Picciolini. And uh, now his life is all about uh, discussing how to reduce polarization, how to help those who are trapped within these ideological bubbles to remove themselves. And he cited receiving compassion and kindness from those he deserved it from the least, right? From the times he needed the most. Mm -hmm. This gets back to, this really ties things together. It's surprise, mm -hmm. right? Conflict of intuition. So this person is supposed to be treating me this way. Mm -hmm. Right? How is this happening? And we seek to belong. Ultimately, our beliefs that we hold, they're meant to build our communities. And if we see a bridge extending towards us into another community, we're more likely to, uh, to put down our guard and to engage in, in a friendly discussion. We're more likely to see that person as what they really are, as a human being. They're not just a box and a label and a category. They're much more complex than that. They're just like us in, those, in that sense. Another great example, a personal hero of mine is Daryl Davis, a blues musician who's written about his um, uh, very surprising journey, uh, having deconverted over, I think it was like 200 Ku Klux Klan members and neo-Nazis through the power of dialogue, through conversations. He never set out to do this. He said he just wanted to understand why people held racist beliefs. But by treating them like human beings and by engaging in real curiosity with them, wanting to understand who they were, um, he was able to uh, 
find out what their deep need was. This uh, need to belong, uh, a need for purpose, a need for, uh, for a sense of, of, of having a place in this world. And so ironically, if our goal is to change other people's beliefs, that's the way to do it. And it's, uh, it's, it's really this, this old adage of, well, you only find happiness when you uh, only seek it instrumentally. Uh, or you, Instead of saying, I want to be happy, you do the things for which happiness is a byproduct, right? If your goal is to help other people to expand their minds and to think uh, in a more circumspect way about things, if you recognize their humanity, if you recognize the brain-based rewards that we have, a sense uh, our values are being recognized, um, a sense that we're, we're being seen and heard, they're more likely to soften the hard edges of their ideological um, belief system that they operate within. Yeah. I mean, what I'm hearing both of you say in terms of recognizing values, remembering that people are human, I think the brain is so quick to just want to have a category. It's like, okay, you just fit here. And it doesn't want to do the extra work of really you know, gathering information and making a full assessment. And so we're quick to just jump to that. And all in that, we lose the humanity. And that's how you see these really polarized sides or how genocides happen or how these things have like, they've, they're convinced that these, these people are not people or not, you know, don't um, deserve the same compassion or, you know, don't share the same values. And so I think when you can push yourself to see that, there's an exercise that I'll have people do sometimes where it's like, think of someone that you just, you know, I think we're using politics is an easy one to think about kind of the more extreme cases but I think on a smaller level it's just like who's someone it could be in your family it could be a coworker who that is just hard for you to get along with they're just kind of hard you know you just don't enjoy being around them for whatever reason you have conflict and and then write down as many things as you can think of that you have in common and just that switch of just like okay we both you know maybe we both um, love soccer and maybe we both uh, are, p are parents or maybe we both you know what like it can be like really simple things it doesn't have to be profound but you're like okay this person you know love like is is a brother or is someone's son or is some you know like to really see the humanity of just like we are not that different and we have these same kind of values or needs at that base level and I think when you can strip that away that leads to really productive like you said building bridges um, and not really I think what's neat about this, the the um, the story of kind of converting these Ku Klux Klan members is that he wasn't like you said he wasn't setting out to convert them he was just seeking to understand them and I think that posture of seeking to understand is huge and I think so often where we feel like we have to protect ourselves or be defensive and so we take this posture of like it's like a battle, right? And we want to win and we want to destroy the other side or dismantle their beliefs or their arguments. And that just isn't productive. It doesn't do anything. So curiosity is something that both of you just spoke about. And I, I, I love that as well, that Daryl Davis was, was curious about what, what's driving these people. And, and we can embrace that spirit of curiosity. We're all curious. And to really change people's minds or make a difference, you want to incentivize the right behaviors or the, the productive behaviors mm -hmm. let's just say and uh, curiosity can be a catalyst for that and again to, to Michael's point from earlier you want to seek that tension of where you're thinking one thing and maybe this other person has another idea there's something to explore there and um, not only was Davis curious about sort of what what's motivating these people but making the other person curious about what's driving you, now you've got something to talk about. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, a way to incentivize that exploration is we are curious by nature and we can unlock these sort of social rewards that come with a good conversation. A, a good conversation should not be two monologues and then I hate you, I hate you back, and you walk away. And it feels as if in, in the current times, People think that's the only answer. It's like the other side's too far gone. There's no common ground. And the re part of the remedy has to be embracing some sense of curiosity. Why is someone thinking differently than me? And then if you approach someone with that in mind, you can s stoke their curiosity of well, why are you thinking something else? And now you're jointly solving a problem, right? And that's a very different mindset than mm -hmm. We're, we are ha at a, a loggerhead of irreconcilable differences. Yeah, absolutely. Any other topics that we want to cover? Do we want to move to kind of our closing? 
Well, before we do that, I think we do have to address the, the national political scene, why it is the way it is. Michael, what are your thoughts on this? So, uh, actually, what we just finished talking about is a good segue to this. Um, there are certain tactics that are the go-tos of campaigning. And they're, f they're as effective as they are when one's social circle, when one's community is homogenous, mm -hmm. in the sense that we only have the strongest ties with those who hold the beliefs like ourselves, the ones we see as fully human. And if we already have a picture of the other side, so to speak, uh, where there's no, uh, there's no resource we can draw from when it comes to personal experience, relationships that we form, then there's no friction in downloading a, a, a campaigning approach which is built on we must stop the other side because they're marauding barbarians here to take our homes, mm -hmm. right? I, I think this is where you have a um, solution at scale. If it becomes more commonly the case where we engage in dialogue with others, we build relationships with those who hold beliefs very different from our own, we see how fully human they, they are. They're not so different from us. If I hear a negative campaign message about people like my neighbor who perhaps votes differently than me, uh, perhaps goes to uh, different political ra uh, rallies than I do, and I hear a message demonizing that person, I know in the back, it's, it's, an, it's an inoculation tool. I know, well, that can't be true. What you're saying about this group of people can't be true because I have a close friend who holds these beliefs. They're nothing like you describe. Mm -hmm. That's where I think it's, it's, it's a bottom-up phenomenon. It's built from our relationships where you start to see a, a sea change um, at scale when it comes to keeping what's effective. Um, what we see from political actors, from politicians, is they use what's effective. What's going to allow them to push their agenda for? What's going to allow them to keep being elected? I think using this public face, private face dichotomy we talked about earlier, I, I don't think it really, if you if name a po politician, I believe that privately they don't really have that belief. I think publicly they use that belief because they understand that that's what's going to get them elected. It's pragmatic, mm -hmm. right? And understanding that also allows us to, if anything, have some compassion for politicians, realizing Maybe that there's a novel idea, right? Is seeing them as human too. Mm -hmm. That's that can be difficult to do at times. Mm -hmm. Is instead of looking at these two D cartoonish figures, realizing they have the same conflicts that we do, and, and what's so difficult about this is mindset. So when you have a two party system, you have a wartime mindset that is invoked, and there's a reason negative campaigning is so prevalent. We all hate it. Why can't they just say what they believe in and inspire us? Well, the reason is negative campaigning evokes threat. And within the brain, threat is one of the most primal emotions, and it usually takes precedence over rewards and happiness and positive emotions, as it should for survival. And in a in sort of a, a tribal sense, uh, the tribe goes to war sometimes, and a very bad plan for warfare is to see the others as human and try to negotiate. There's a time for warfare. Mm -hmm. And uh, not that one couldn't de-escalate, but, but a two-party system naturally lends itself to a wartime mindset where if one party or one candidate begins going negative, the other has to, to neutralize it and to fight it because you gain a great advantage by negative campaigning. So I, I've, over the years, started to forgive uh, politicians more. I can see them as more human. They have to negative campaign because it's so incredibly effective. The threat drives unanimity on your side mm -hmm. and demonizes the other side where it becomes toxic and I think the we've used the term toxic uh, tribalism is where you begin to see all of the other side is uniformly bad and they have the same idea and it's all wrong-headed and you begin to depersonalize people and no longer see them as individuals and then you head down that road that um, we talked about with Christian, Christian Picciolini where you, you've you've adopted some sort of ideology that's um, absolutely warlike with the goal of, of crushing some opposition. And, you know, we, I guess really that we have to think in terms of why do we have the system we have? Well, they're two parties, so they're naturally opposed. And it's very theatrical. So, you know, political theater is often what's reflected in news sources and definitely in propaganda sources. It's almost all theatrical, meaning it's, it's to evoke unanimity on one side and crush the other side. We're in election season all the time now, and we can't seem to break free of that. 
Um, so I, I think that this is this is sort of my perspective, and a, a, to put a positive spin and continue this sort of conversation more productively, is just keep in mind, you know, they, they have to say these things if they're going to be successful on the campaign trail. Uh, but doesn't mean we have to enjoy it or reward them for it. I mean, as citizens, we can ask better of our our politicians get around actually governing. You know, and. Mm -hmm. It's hard to do because the media landscape often um, seems to, to go toward the negative so much. And so I, I think embracing curiosity about the issue, okay, you're saying this and making it sound very definitive, what would be the other side of that, you know, that, that issue? And is there something that I'm not seeing? Because should, we should be skeptical of the 100% truth answer because the world's complex. And I think that scares a lot of people. I think people would like it to just be sim more simple and just like, this is what it is and I don't have to really dig into this and kind of think and that, that just takes extra cognitive effort that a lot of times we don't have. And especially if we are in, you know, I think this is a very kind of privileged conversation to have that we have the resources and capacity to think about these things because if you're just like, your important thing is getting enough money together to pay your rent and get you know put food on the table it's like we don't have you know the the resources to really devote to kind of going that extra step further that work that that takes and i mean i couldn't agree more with just this the negativity bias that we have and how fear is just the most powerful motivator and really when we're in that state of fear it's your amygdala and your limbic system that's driving and so then we can't tap into our prefrontal cortex and we can't really do this extra this piece of curiosity but um, if we are aware of that and we can catch ourselves of like oh I am feeling you know fearful that my values are threatened or whatever that is we can choose to become curious so it's not that we can't be curious it's just that we have to actually try and think okay let me ask a question here and so that's kind of a very practical just way to sort of break out of the the limbic emotional driving system into more of a reasoning system um, which I think is something that um, is just hard to do if you're kind of sort of just constantly in survival mode in fight or flight it's not going to be um, you know something that people have time for but if we do have time for it then that's you know I think retraining that muscle to think like okay instead of just you know duck and cover it's like let's really um, let's actually move towards this and and engage what I'm hearing is pivot to the peacetime mindset which is yeah. the alternative which is the reality we live in as citizens we're not on the campaign trail so why in the world do we act like we're at war with one another we're not even campaigning right you know and it's it's an easy move it doesn't actually have to take that much effort if we just give people sort of the benefit of the doubt approach them with a charitable attitude um, sort of a good faith attitude um, that can go a long way and we you know we have within our mind that ability to go to the wartime and then pivot to the peacetime the peacetime mindset being let's be productive as a tribe it's not let's all get along and be moderates which mm -hmm. is totally bland but actually let's celebrate the diversity of skills we have within our tribe the strongest tribe isn't made up of uniform actors who all have the same skills. That'd be a very bad tribe to be part of. The most effective tribe can cover bad weather, you know, scarcity, times mm -hmm. of plenty, you know, how to defuse conflict, and embracing sort of those those uh, diverse skills. Um, that that isn't campaign trail friendly, but that's an answer for the citizen. I think is to kind of remind yourself you're not at war, so what's the point of alienating mm -hmm. <laughs> other people mm -hmm. when it doesn't really matter all you're achieving is sort of making an enemy when you might have had a friend or, or a colleague and that's actually a form of diversity we can all celebrate the idea that our dispositions our values what makes us each unique individuals there's a place for all of us and if you look at the most ad adaptive societies what we can imagine it's as you said it's a tribe at the largest scale instead of in, in dozens in the Pleistocene era <laughs> or where our, our human brains were evolved, here we're talking the scale of million, millions, but recognizing a diversity of, of skills, uh, perspectives, points of view creates a stronger organism as it were.
Mm. Just like we, as neuroscientists, we can appreciate that the brain has a collection of inhibitory and excitatory circuits, right? You need opponent processes to be held in tension in a perfect balance in order to have an organism that functions properly. Mm. If you had a brain with only excitatory circuits or only inhibitory circuits, well, we're aware of the sorts of disorders of behavior that result from this. Mm. Similarly, similarly, a homogenous society where you had a single ideological perspective being represented and completely eradicating the other side, you have a dysfunctional society. Mm -hmm. It's a pyrrhic victory. In fact, the world that we want to inhabit is nothing like the world we think it would be if our side was the only side represented. You need that tension. You need that diversity of perspectives because no one person has the perfect uh, God's eye point of view of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dictatorships aren't fun to live in, right? That's, <laughs> that's a state where there's one true yeah. opinion and there's no dissent. People, it's incompatible with human flourishing, right? Even though it, it might be good for warfare, you know? Yeah. And so again, I think Michael's point is, is well made. A lot of these ideas, you know, a lot of the questions that we'll get around the brain, is technology good or bad, is it this or that? And the, the answer we often give is it depends. And so similarly with political views or certain you know policies things that are trying to go into place it's like there is no one size fits all right you have to have like there there are things that are conditional or dependent on the context the circumstance the the people there and so there's this flexibility that needs to happen that's hard to do when it comes to just political parties and they have to they have to pick a stance um, they can't just say well it <laughs> depends in this in this stance we'll take this view and in this circumstance we'll take another but I think just seeing the the need for like you said that that understanding Understanding of uh, the flexible nature that the brain needs that also kind of as a human population you know it can't be this rigid rigorous only one mode of thinking all the time that's not helpful and it's not it would not benefit survival and I think we can look to sports here as well so um, you know you can sports are sort of an outlet for a lot of this a team tribalism mentality in, a, in kind of a harmless way as long as it's not a riot right and um, I think it's fascinating how our political parties have mascots they have color schemes they have heroes they have in, in a sense coaches right like Mitch McConnell is the coach of the Republican side and the coach has to is not gonna break character and say well actually they have a really good point mm -hmm. but his whole job is to promote sort of the the unanimity and as, as a someone who grew up in Buffalo New York I'm a Bills fan naturally and um, you know there's a side of me that is is just rooting for us to destroy the formerly mighty Patriots you know in, in the last year's playoffs the Bills obliterated the Patriots in front of the home crowd and that's in in Buffalo that's the stuff of legend greatest game ever right but for the national audience worst game ever it was so boring I turned it off after the first quarter <laughs> meanwhile the Bills lost to the Chiefs in the final overtime in that same playoffs. It was a nightmare for people from Buffalo. The rest of the nation, greatest game of the season. And so we naturally, ha you see that ability to root for the one side, wartime. Um, and so you want to be the kind of fan of sports and of politics where you can say, well, we took the loss there, but it was a great game. And we can all root for the great game uh, as entertainment. We can root for the well-contested um, political dialogue as well and start to punish the poorly contested one that's just name-calling and nonsense and aiming for a bl unanimous mm -hmm. blowout. That's not victory. Um, what we should root for is kind of that, that debate and dialogue. So it all kind of goes back to that art of dialogue. And this might be a good point to pivot toward how do we have these conversations? This all sounds fantastic, but the conversations are tough. What are some of the roadblocks? What are some of the tactics we can use? So I, I think it's acknowledging up front that one's perspective is not complete, right? Um, wherever one can admit that one's perspective has limitations, right? Wherever you can put that front and center, it's to signal to the person you're speaking to that you don't have this notion that you have all the answers. And you can also make it clear explicitly to them that you're interested 
and what their experience has taught them about life. Um, how, that's interesting. You, oh, you see things differently than me. I, I'm kind of curious, like, uh, wh where did you grow up? Maybe um, that could uh, be an explanation for how we see things differently. There's a whole diversity of reasons, people's biographies, people's family members, experiences they've had. Um, that's how you build relationships uh, in politics, because you're getting to the root person. You're getting down to the marrow of their values as a person. That's, that's where it's an opportunity. Right, that's, what, that's how we should see it. It's an opportunity to learn about another person because it's deeply personal to them, right? And, and instead of looking at this as, oh, okay, this is just a situation where there's going to be a conflict and we're going to destroy each other, right? And so always keeping that in mind, I'm here specifically to explore, right? And so if someone starts to uh, go into, say, a, a ranting mode, that we might want to say, right? You can express them. You can let them know that you, you hear them. You let them know. It sounds to me like it's very important to you that our uh, country is safe. Security is really important to you. And you know, honestly, it's very important to me too. You can make it clear to them if it's clear what value it is that they're expressing, that value is important to you as well. right? And that's how they see you as being human just like them. They realize, oh, the things that are important to me are important to you too. Taking those opportunities uh, to measure the tone and bringing it to a place of being more conciliatory, even more lighthearted. Uh, these are the sorts of tactics that we can use. Um, it's really this balance of, as we've been saying before, the limbic system and the uh, prefrontal cortex. You can see in real time as that's shifting mm -hmm. with someone. And you can see uh, where there's rocky terrain, where you've hit an emotional tripwire. Perhaps it's strategic to withdraw from the topic and pivot to something else, realizing, okay, this is not a topic. It's so ossified that perhaps we should go somewhere else with a little more movement, a little more playroom. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. I was speaking to a friend of mine about uh, a specific policy uh, called universal basic income. Right, the idea that it's like social security for all, right? Uh, but it's not means tested for age. And at the surface level, we're at loggerheads. It's clear we didn't we didn't agree on the topic. As far as who thought what doesn't it's not important here. The point is this actually became a more interesting conversation because we realized, well, actually what it comes down to is when do you give someone enough of a head start to where uh, it breaks initiative altogether to take care of oneself? There's a balance point in all of us. It was that's the real question. And then we end up talking about ourselves. Times where we received help, when we needed it the most in our lives. When did it start to break our initiative? And when was it just enough to give us that sense of, you know what? Uh, I, I feel like this is the catalyst I need to take action to get myself in a better situation in life. And that's what the conversation turned into. And we found ourselves uh, in this place where the policy debate was just a vehicle to get ourselves to talking about our lives, getting to know each other. To talk and about core values. Core values, exactly. I love that example. That's, that's really helpful. Um, I also love, I guess w one of my takeaways is just this idea that you know, for a lot of people, it's hard to admit that they don't, that there are g information gaps, that they don't know everything, or that they'd be willing to kind of set aside that pride and, and just in humility be like, Let, help me understand, you know, or I want, I want to understand. I think um, it takes a level of confidence or, or just kind of safety um, to feel free to be able to engage in that dialogue with someone. And so I think if it is like you know the outraged uncle at the table that person can be intimidating because you're like I, c I can come t I think there's sometimes a fear of like I can come to it with an open mind and with a curiosity and with asking questions and it may just be like you know hitting a brick wall <laughs> it may be it may not be reciprocated but it's not a reason not to try but I do think sometimes it's twofold one it's it's you have a camp of people where it's like maybe hard to to engage in asking questions because they it's hard for them to even admit to themselves that they don't have the full picture um, and then you have the other hand where it's maybe circumstances where you're like okay I do want to be curious but um, yeah that person is not in a position um, to, <laughs> to engage so kind of navigating uh, everything in between it's also keeping in mind that if the goal here is the alternative to just being combative. The alternative goal we're talking about here is building relationships. Mm -hmm. So if the long-term goal is this is not the only conversation you're gonna have with this person, yeah. it's realized that this is not the first and last word on the topic. Mm -hmm. That this is all gradual. And going back to our Daryl Davis example, right? This is this blues music musician who deconverted all these Ku Klux Klan members. It wasn't a single conversation mm -hmm. where this happened. Mm -hmm. um, it was 
over the course of building a relationship with somebody, right? So when we're talking about tactics, it's to keep in mind if there's a sense of impatience with this individual, where they, they seem like they're very rigid in their beliefs and you're not getting much movement out of them, it's to think, well, if it really matters to you that much, then it sounds to, uh, like you're invested. You're invested in having a relationship with this person and having a friendship, perhaps. And over time, you'll st I think it happens organically. Even when you're not talking about politics, mm -hmm. somebody's already in the back of their mind updating their beliefs. They're realizing this person is not so different from me. Mm -hmm. Gosh, that's what curiosity is. Yes. It's the brain's opportunity to update. Mm -hmm. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of um, comparative psychology. I'm always sort of watching other you know, documentaries on mammals and like I've been watching a lot of elephant documentaries lately and there was a moment where you had a big dominant elephant at the at the watering hole and another big dominant elephant was coming toward him and uh, what he what the <laughs> what the newcomer did is 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 like extended his trunk diffusing this sort mm -hmm. of potential conflict and it's so fascinating because elephants will flap their ears and kind of get tall if they're going to be aggressive and that's a, if you do that in, as a human in a conversation guess what you're, you're going to be in a dominance shoving match and the best that's going to happen is <laughs> maybe you make an enemy for the future yeah. <laughs> right mm -hmm. and so we don't have the benefit of, of the obvious cue like the elephants do but we can do the same thing if we extend the trunk mm -hmm. right and make try to inspire curiosity i like what you said you want to validate someone else's you're hearing them you hear their mm -hmm. their perspective but don't just outright validate it and let them walk away um try to flip it in a, in a way that surprises by maybe pivoting to some new ground within that general topic that neither you neither of you necessarily are experts in mm -hmm. and that's an opportunity to learn and I think you can win people over that way you know that you just diffuse the bomb mm -hmm. and then once you've done that you can work as a tribe and actually the more different you are often the more there is to learn from one another in fact even if you're thinking about what victory looks like right so but when I'm not, a, uh, you know, my, wearing my scientist hat, uh, one way I, I deal with stress in my life and, and have a sort of um, balancing mechanism for myself is I'm passionate about martial arts, right? In Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, uh, in particular, I've been doing this for more than a decade. And I've, much of what I think about politics is actually derived from my experience in that world, realizing that what really helps you to grow as an individual is helping the other person to grow. Right? In fact, there's this expression that we sometimes use is that you're only ever as strong as your greatest opponent because what they're able to do to test you is what helps you to grow and vice versa. And so when engaged in dialogue with another individual about politics, there's this opportunity to build each other up. And the more they are built up, so too are you because they're better uh, informed, able to ask better questions. They're able to explore territories uh, that they weren't equipped to explore prior to talking to you because of what they've learned from you and vice versa. I think that's an excellent note to end on. I feel like that's a great, um, yeah, I don't know that it's I... a great conversation. Yeah. Thanks so much, Michael, for taking the time to do this. Oh, this is a real pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.